Hello and welcome to the Take 15 podcast from CFA Institute. I'm Lauren Foster and this is the show where we bring you an unbiased lens on investing and capital markets through short conversations with some of the world's most interesting and accomplished people. This week on the show is a guest I am very excited about, Andrew Lowe, Professor of Finance at MIT. Professor Lowe has focused his prolific academic career on areas such as risk, quantitative models, and machine learning applications. In recent years, his work and personal experiences led him to dedicate his time when he's not teaching to healthcare finance. And that is the topic of his conversation with my colleague Anastasia Diakaki, the guest host this week. Professor Lowe discusses what led him to work in this critical and very timely field and how it ties to his work in machine learning and AI. He also talks about a new kind of AI that we all need and whether we should all upskill with some computer programming skills. And now, on with the show. Please enjoy this conversation with Andrew Lowe. So welcome, Professor Andrew Lowe. Uh, it's great yeah. to have you here. Um, so let's start off uh, by talking about healthcare finance. Uh, it's the area where you've dedicated your work over the last few years. Um, can you talk to us about you know, your work and your philosophy and your approach when it comes to this sector? Sure. Well, so first, by way of disclosure, I really have no healthcare background whatsoever before I began looking into this field. I got interested for really personal reasons, friends and family dealing with various kinds of cancer and in trying to be sympathetic to what they were going through, trying to understand a little bit more about the kind of drugs they were looking for, I came to a really shocking realization. And that is that finance plays a very big role in drug development, sometimes too big a role. And in many cases, it ends up sort of twisting the whole process backwards where the financing ends up driving the scientific agendas of a number of biotech and pharma companies rather than the other way around. And so that's really why I started getting interested and applying the tools of my trade uh, in finance to uh, these kinds of biomedical challenges. And so uh, can you talk to us a bit about these applications? What, what are the applications of these, these tools? Well, I guess the first application is really to think about the whole drug development process as an investment problem. And I guess part of the reason is that one of the key aspects of drug development that I hit upon very early in the process is the fact that money really plays a central role. I know that sounds obvious, but I guess, uh, you know, from my naive perspective, I just assume that if there was the need among patients and there was some technology that scientists and clinicians have developed to be able to treat those diseases and, and meet those needs, then the money would magically appear and, and get those uh, therapies developed. And I realized that that's actually not the case, that there are a number of situations where we have the scientific means, we have the medical knowledge, and we actually have all of the various different practical engineering aspects to be able to create these amazing drugs, but we don't have the funding. And the key aspect of it is the fact that drug development has these three unique characteristics, um, each of which is not unique, but taken together, it's sort of the, 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 the triple whammy that makes it very difficult to develop drugs. And the three characteristics are, it takes a lot of money to develop a drug on the order of hundreds of millions to billions of dollars. Uh, second, the probability of success is generally pretty low in cancer historically. The success rate is about 5% or less. And third, it takes a very long time to do the clinical trials to see whether or not a drug is safe and effective on the order of 10 to 15 years in some cases. And so when you've got an investment opportunity with all three of those characteristics, it turns out that investors just provide less capital than to other lower hanging fruit in the investment universe. Um, so. Uh... You know, another, first of all, do you think that um, the pandemic now, obviously, I'm sure you get asked about the pandemic now uh, constantly when it comes to healthcare finance, but do you think it has accelerated uh, some of these processes? Obviously, not when it comes to rare diseases, but 
when when it comes to you know we hear about the vaccination being de being developed and the amount of time it's getting and the funding for that what has your kind of view been observing that uh, from the inside in a way well obviously the pandemic has been a terrible disaster for humanity and uh, many many people have died as a result uh, so it's kind of hard to see any good that comes out of this but if there is a silver lining and, and i think there is one and that silver lining is that now all of us, and in particular governments, have realized the importance of dealing with these kinds of challenges on a prospective basis rather than a retrospective basis. We now realize that we have to prepare for pandemics because they can and do happen. And we've had warnings before, and unfortunately, we really haven't heeded those warnings. And I think that this most recent COVID-19 pandemic is probably what it took in order to be able to get all of these different countries now to be focusing on it. So that is a, a positive element. I worry that now attention will focus on vaccines and, and infectious diseases, and we'll forget that we still have to deal with cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes, heart disease. There are many other needs. But I think overall, this will be a good thing because it will focus everybody, not just governments, but the private sector and other organizations on the need to be able to do more to support healthcare. Another area of expertise of yours is that of machine learning. Do you find that um, there are machine learning applications when it comes to healthcare in general, but also the work that you have been doing on healthcare finance? Well, very much so. So my original interest in machine learning really came out of pure finance. We were trying to understand how to estimate credit quality among various different parties like mortgages and credit card receivables and so on. And machine learning is fantastic for those applications because you have a lot of data and you can be able to do tests out of sample very easily. But um, it wasn't until I started getting interested in healthcare that I realized that actually machine learning has a ton of applications here as well. Of course, there are many people that have already used machine learning for things like drug discovery, designing molecules uh, from the ground up using various characteristics of both the disease as well as the various different drugs. But one of the things that I've been focusing on is the investment problem, which is from an investor's perspective, if I put money into an early stage drug or device development project, what are the likelihood, what is the chances that I'm going to be able to see a payout at the very end? And it turns out that machine learning is useful for that application as well. So a couple of years ago, I published a paper showing that using various characteristics of drug development projects, things like the sponsor track record, the particular properties of the drug itself, the disease, the combination of the various different design of the clinical trial process, all of those components you can think of as right-hand side variables that you can use to predict whether or not a clinical trial will be successful. And ultimately that's what investors care about. They care about whether or not they're gonna be able to get a return on their capital. So I've been doing work on this and actually it turns out the machine learning is very useful. And in many cases, it actually has much more accurate predictions than just using historical averages of success or failure. And so we've been publishing these numbers now and the hope is that uh, the industry is going to be able to make use of them and ultimately turn the investment problem into something that we in finance are much more familiar with, namely portfolio optimization and risk management. Speaking of machine learning applications more broadly, uh, when it comes to you know, practitioner applications by professionals outside uh, academia, where do you think, where have you personally seen uh, you know, the biggest successes when it comes to applying algorithms in practice? And where is there more room for, for improvement and opportunity? Well, so in healthcare, it's interesting. There's been a lot of success in applying quantitative methods to drug design. And so physicists, chemists, biologists have been collaborating now for decades in making use of these very, very sophisticated analytics to be able to figure out exactly how to interfere with disease using a modern medicine. But it's been only recently that we've gotten enough data to start applying those same analytic methods to constructing biomedical portfolios. So I think that that's the next undiscovered country that I'm most excited about. It, it's very much like the way that investments in uh, 
it, it's very much the same as the way financial investments were uh, in the 1960s and 70s. At that time, it was pretty straightforward to construct an index fund the way that Vanguard and, and other companies started uh, in that period. But there wasn't a lot of use of analytics for making financial investments until the 1970s and 80s when you had the advent of electronic trading and uh, now the ability to uh, manage portfolios using optimization algorithms. I think that where we are today in biomedicine is very much like where we were in investments in the 1980s. It's really the beginning of a whole uh, you know, effort to systematize investing using these kinds of tools. So I'm very excited about that. It sounds very exciting. And uh, you know, it kind of brings up this question that we, we have had in general you know, about knowledge and skills. Uh, you know, especially for us specifically when it comes to investment professionals, do you think that uh, computer science has become uh, or is going to become this general area of uh, basic life skills that everyone should have? And, you know, when it comes, to, we hear a lot about investment you know, analysts and uh, practitioners in general wanting to learn Python. Um, is computer science this new life skill that everyone should have? Should people upskill? Well, without a doubt, computing is something that we all need to be exposed to and have some proficiency in. That's a little different than computer science. So I think that computer science as the foundation of computing is critical. And there are a number of very important discoveries that have occurred over the last few years that's accelerated the progress in this field. However, I don't think it's necessary for all of us to become computer scientists, but we all have to be computer literate, which means that we have to understand how to engage in these technologies in our respective fields. So if you're studying healthcare, you need to understand how computing has completely transformed healthcare, both on the drug discovery side, but also on the healthcare delivery side with telemedicine and all of the bioinformatics that are being used now uh, in recommending therapies to patients. If you're in the field of, um, I don't know, uh, uh, entertainment, you know, clearly uh, Netflix and um, you know, some of the uh, uh, internet companies uh, have really transformed the way that uh, individuals access uh, content. And, and you know, many of these organizations have now become uh, part of the production aspects of entertainment. Um, Netflix is, routinely produces many hits. And so computing has really changed everything. And we need to be able to embrace that change in our own respective domains. So I would say that, yeah, I think a lot of us need to go back to school and uh, be able to get back up to speed on what the implications of computing are for on our own particular professions. And uh, you know, going back to uh, machine learning algorithms used in the investment process, do you, uh, do you think that there is still a question mark when it comes to the interpretability of, of, of the results? You know, do, do you find that people in, in practice are, are there yet um, when it comes to that? So that is the biggest challenge right now in machine learning. There's no doubt that these tools are incredibly powerful and they do provide tremendous accuracy in certain contexts in making predictions. So we can't live without them. But you hit upon a very important point, which is interpretability. For the most part, these technologies are black boxes. We don't know why they make the predictions. We don't know when those predictions start breaking down until we see them failing in practice. And so one of the things that computer scientists, as well as other researchers, are working on right now is to try to turn these black boxes into glass boxes. We need to be able to see inside them understand how they work and when they fail. And we're not there yet. There's still a lot more research that needs to be done, but there are some techniques that are starting to emerge that allow us to be able to figure out, you know, which are the key features that are driving a machine learning forecast or what happens when you perturb the initial conditions slightly to see whether or not the forecasts change a whole lot. So there are a bunch of tools that are being developed, but none of them right now is the silver bullet in trying to allow us to understand uh, exactly where these forecasts are coming from and how they might change. 
And until we do that, until we are able to turn that black box into a glass box, we will not be able to fully trust these algorithms. And that's really the bottom line. For financial markets, it's all about trust. And if we don't trust in these algorithms, they will never play the important role that they could otherwise once we develop that level of understanding. You're a professor at MIT and you're teaching you know, the, the professionals of tomorrow or even of today often in your grad classes. Do you find, you know, going back to this computer science um, skills question, um, do you see your current students as being a lot more comfortable with these concepts and with these technologies than they were a few years ago? Without a doubt, our students today are so much more sophisticated than I was when I was a student. And it's both gratifying and a little bit scary. <laughs> they uh, are very fast in being able to use technology and they obviously have enormous amounts of knowledge literally at their fingertips thanks to search engines that we use every day. And so the students of today, I think are technologically more savvy but I wonder and I worry about whether or not they have somehow lost something uh, along the way, whether or not uh, things are a little too easy for them and they may not have the same level of focus and concentration that, uh, that we did before we had these technologies. I think on balance, definitely it's a plus and, and they're certainly at a greater advantage. But I do think that there is some opportunity for us to step back on occasion put the technology aside and exercise human creativity to see whether or not we might be able to work more productively together with the technology to really leverage our abilities. Okay, well, we have time for one last question. So I've heard you talk about an AI uh, that is more of a human intelligence, um, you know, an AI that uh, has the ability to understand and kind of foresee human biases and faults. Um, can you talk a bit more about this concept? Sure, well, this came out of a paper that I co-authored with my former student and now research colleague, Alexander Remerov. We tried to develop an understanding of human frailty. In other words, how is it the case that humans make mistakes and, and why, why do they do that? At the end of that process, one of the students in my lab looked at our results and said, this is not artificial intelligence, this is artificial stupidity. And what you're trying to do is to model human mistakes. And that's exactly right. Until we understand why it is that we don't make the best decisions in certain contexts, we won't really understand the limits and the underlying drivers of human intelligence. So for the last several years, my co-authors and I have been trying to model that process by which we make mistakes, developing algorithms that actually capture actual human decision-making. Because our view is that once we can model from the ground up the kind of mistakes that we make in everyday situations, once we're able to do that, at that point we can develop truly useful AI that will prevent us from our own worst natures. It will allow us to understand and ultimately prevent the kind of mistakes that we make and give us a better sense of the true correct decisions that we're all striving towards. Um, so the hope is that we will actually get to that point where AI really will allow us to understand HI, uh, human intelligence. And I think we're close, but we're not quite there yet. Fascinating. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you, it was a pleasure speaking with you. You've been listening to the Take 15 podcast from CFA Institute. If you haven't yet subscribed, you can do so on our YouTube channel or wherever you listen to the show. That way, you never miss an episode. And if you enjoyed today's show, we'd appreciate a rating and review. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us too. And a quick reminder, this podcast isn't intended to provide expert advice on the topics we covered. If you need tax, accounting or legal advice, please consult a professional. I'm Lauren Foster. Thanks so much for listening and see you next week.